Uh, well, thank you uh, for inviting me along tonight. Um, as mentioned, I'm Peter Cousin. I'm the commercial manager for the National Park Authority, so that's South Downs National Park Authority. And uh, the main part of my work at the moment, at least, is Seven Sisters Country Park. Uh, so that's what I've come to talk to you about this evening. Uh, we'll talk a little bit just about kind of the <coughs> National Park Authority itself and what our purposes and duty are, but then we'll get into the detail of what we're doing at Seven Sisters Country Park. Uh, just up the road, uh, just near Seaford. So, starting off with that bit about the South Downs National Park Authority. So, it's uh, the youngest of the national parks, as I'm sure you know. Uh, so, just 11 years old now. Um, and essentially, we are a public body. We are funded by government. Um, and we are responsible for keeping the South Downs special and maintaining that landscape uh, and... Uh, we are governed uh, by a board of members. We have 27 members, um, some of which I think might be around tonight. Um, but yes, we have 27 members um, who, uh, who we report to. And we have two purposes and a duty. So purpose one is to conserve and enhance the natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage of the area. Uh, purpose two, to promote opportunities for the understanding and enjoyment of special qualities of National Park by the public. And then we also have a running alongside all of that, our duty, and that is around fostering local communities um, and social economic well-being for the area as well. So what I'm going to talk to you about is essentially how we're delivering those two purposes and that duty at Seven Sisters Country Park. Why we've decided this is such an iconic site and we need to take ownership of it and we need to ensure it's properly managed going forward. So let's start off with the basics. So what is Seven Sisters Country Park? It can be a bit confusing. Uh, so the first thing uh, which I'm sure you all know is the Seven Sisters themselves. Uh, however, Seven Sisters Country Park is actually only three and a half of the Seven Sisters. So the first three and a half coming from so Haven Brow, the highest one there, that being the first, so we're starting Seaford End, moving towards Eastbourne. So the first three and a half is within the Seven Sisters Country Park. After that, it moves on to the National Trust's Berlin Gap and Seven Sisters estate. So about half and half we own together. So that is probably the most famous thing about the, the park. And truth be told, that's probably the reason most people come and visit. Definitely, I was there on the Easter Bank holiday weekend, and most people coming into our visitor centre said, how can I go and see the cliffs? We also, quite uh, popular as well, is the famous Cookmere Meanders. No longer actually connected to the Cookmere River, haven't been for about 140 years. Um, but still uh, an iconic view and endless geography field trips we see coming through to come and look at those iconic meanders and talk about how they were created. So those are the two things we're perhaps most famous for. But one thing um, that we want to do is we want to make it about the wildlife as well. This site is absolutely teeming with wildlife. It's teeming with heritage. But actually most people, they go down, they look at the cliffs, they go back, they get in their cars and they go home. We want people to stay longer, we want them to visit and really engage with what's going on in the whole country park. So that's what we're going to be talking to you about today. So, a bit more details. So the whole size of the park is about 280 hectares. Uh, so we have lots of very rare habitats. We have chalk grassland, which of course the South Downs is famous for, even though it only makes up about a quarter, 20% of the whole national park. So it's incredibly rare. We also have south-facing chalk grassland, which is even rarer because so much of it was ploughed up long ago because it can be such productive land. So most of what's left is the north-facing stuff where other things wouldn't grow as well. We have vegetated shingle. There's very little vegetated shingle left in the southeast of England, and I'll talk more about that later and what makes that so special. We have marsh grassland as well, so really wet areas and all the different plants and birds that rely on that. And then we've got a little bit of salt marsh. So just along the river, just around this area here on the map, you can see we have a little bit of salt marsh, which with climate change and global warming, 
is only going to become more. But the great thing is salt marsh, great for biodiversity, great uh, for wildlife, great for absorbing carbon, but it is different from what we have now. But there's going to be more of it. So on the right there, you can see a little bit more. This area here, that's our marsh grassland. Up on the hillside here, that's where we have our chalk grasslands. And then this area here is what we call semi-improved grassland, but I will tell you more about that later. Visitors. We don't really know how many visitors are coming to this site. So we've only owned the site since last year, um, and previously nobody really kept any records of how many visitors. Our best guess and is somewhere between half a million and a million visitors a year. My money is that it's closer to a million visits a year. We have 14 buildings on the site, so it's known for its countryside, but actually we've got quite a lot of buildings. Three of those are listed. We have four scheduled monuments. Now, this map on the left, all that's in orange, those are heritage monuments, they're listed buildings, things like that. So you can see every single orange mark is some kind of heritage on that site. A lot of it's buried, um, a lot of it's hard to see, but it's, it is there. We have our site of special scientific interest, so commonly called a triple SI. So that means uh, we were designated back in the 60s that these habitats are important and must be protected. And Natural England, another, um, another government body, they have responsibility to ensure that we are looking after them as well as they should be looked after. We also, parts of the area, this side of the meanders is part of the Seaford Nature Reserve as well, so that comes with certain rules and its own body that ensures that that's protected. We're part of the Heritage Coast, which stretches from us there, and that goes over to Eastbourne. And of course, we are mostly open access. North of the main road there, the A259, that section there is not open access, but all the rest of the park is open access. People can come and they can go wherever they like within the park. I don't think that many people do go around the whole park. And actually, I think if I challenge you to walk from one side of the park to the other at the moment, you would really struggle because of all the fences, all the gates. But that is something also we want to really improve on and really make that real open access so everyone can enjoy the whole park. So that's what it is, but who is visiting? So you can see that map on the side there. So just before we took ownership last year, uh, we took a few surveys, not vast amount, 585 people. So just dipping our toe without one million visitors, but just to see where are people coming from. And as you can see, mostly southeast corner, but we do get people from further north. And London, one of our biggest visitor areas is London. On our website, 60% of people that visit our website are looking at it from London. So that is the main place that people are visiting from for the website. Obviously, local interest, most people aren't going on the website if they're local. Uh, but having said that, um, when we took our visitors, this section here, that's local visitors. That section is day visitors. That section is overnight visitors. So thinking about particularly how it influences Eastbourne, when we uh, spoke to all those overnight visitors, most of them, the place they're mostly staying is in Eastbourne. So for Eastbourne, it is a key tourist attraction. And standing in our visitor centre on the bank holiday weekend, most people who have come down have got the train down to Eastbourne. They're spending a night in Eastbourne and they're doing it, getting the bus out and bus back. So it's part of that whole visitor economy for the area. So, what are we going to do here? So, uh, I summed it up with the first slide as better for people, better for nature. But our official vision is an outstanding place for nature and people where we work with landscape and communities to demonstrate how to adapt to climate change. Uh, now, those of you who know the site um, might have already started to see a change over the, few, the last few years. Climate change is definitely starting to have its effect on the site. We haven't had a drop of rain on this site since early April. Um, the saltings, the bottom lagoons, are completely dried out. 
We keep on trying to top them up, but they should be full at this time of year. We are already starting to see those changes happen. Uh, there's certain things we can do, and we will, we're looking to mitigate and minimise our impact on climate change, but also how are we going to adapt? How are we going to go to our partners? This is how you adapt to climate change. The site's going to look different. Different plants are going to grow. Maybe we'll see some more salt marsh. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is definitely going to be changing. And how do we manage that change? So that is our vision. But I sum it up with my team whenever I'm talking to them. Better for people, better for nature. So the road to ownership. Uh, so previously, uh, prior to us owning it, it was owned by East Sussex County Council. Um, and then it was various people managed it. There were uh, various authorities managed it over the years. Right back, I think it was gifted in the 1920s by the Duke of Devonshire. Um, and then there's been various hands over the years. So, um, we, uh, there was a few bidders for the site. Um, and the South Downs National Park Authority were chosen as a successful bidder. Uh, and that was largely because we were going to invest uh, what was planned to be 1.9 million, uh, we've massively overspent. We think we're going to spend 2.6 million now. Uh, um, and it also kept it in public ownership. So it was about preserving it. It was a public asset and always would be. So we had to get Secretary of State approval. Uh, when um, public land is transferred, you have to get Secretary of State. And you have to get the Secretary of State in charge of county councils and the one from DEFRA to approve it. That was a big piece of work to get that done. Uh, we then had eight months of um, almost daily calls of lawyers trying to work out the paperwork because it had been gifted in lots of different times and different pieces. So it was not a, co a simple thing. Also, as some of you may know, there's plans for a new bridge over at Exit as well. So East Sussex wanted to protect their right to be able to build that bridge in future. It was not straightforward. but. On the 30th of July last year, we finally managed to get it all through and South Downs National Park Authority became the owners of the site. So, the first bit, better for nature. Um, so, photo there, just some of our highlight species, which I'll talk to you more about in a minute. This, uh, the, our short-eared owls. So, until this year, they had never been known on this site. Never been seen there before. We've changed the management of the site, which I'm going to talk to you about, and now we have five overwintering there. All our rangers said to us, oh, they'll overwinter, and then they go to Russia and Scandinavia in the summer. They'll be gone by end of March at the latest. They're still there. We think they might be actually breeding, which is a really exciting development. This would be, I think, the furthest south in the UK. There's one... There's a few in the Thames estuary, but they're nearly all Scotland, Scandinavia. They generally don't breed here. But if they've got enough food and they're comfortable, they will stay. We have these uh, ringed plovers, um, a bird that is incredibly sensitive because they lay their eggs on the shingle there. <laughs> and of course, when you have a million visitors, many of which have dogs, the challenges we have on making sure this bird can succeed are really high. And also, we have to remember, it's an open access site. We cannot stop anyone going anywhere if they so choose. So how do we balance our million visitors a year, ensuring they can have a fantastic time and a fantastic experience, but allowing these birds to breed successfully? And then another uh, animal which is doing so well on the site are our adders. So we're really seeing the apex predators really doing well, and that is because there's more food stuff for them. So we'll go into the detail of how we got that more food stuff for our apex predators. And essentially our biggest and most important tool in our conservation arsenal is grazing. So essentially, uh, the way it's nice to think of it is if we're trying to restore more natural processes, and we have to remember that in natural processes there would be grazing animals. There's always been grazing animals. We don't have the wild grazing animals anymore, like the bison, like the auroch. So we don't have the wild boar. So essentially we're replacing them. And we're doing that with our fantastic various rare breeds of animals. 
Now, I put four animals here. They all graze in incredibly different ways. And therefore, they, we can use them in different ways to achieve different things. So, in the bottom left here, uh, we have our Sussex cattle, so native breed to the area. Um, we're using some really nice young steers here. We're working with Plumpton College, so we're doing some education alongside as well. Uh, and we're using a really innovative system, which I'll tell you about in a minute, on how we control them as well. So, we've got our... Now, the great thing with cattle is they don't bite, they rip with their tongues. So, they are ripping all the grass, they're not biting down. You then have the sheep, uh, so these are South Down sheep, so another uh, local breed. The sheep will eat completely differently, they will nibble things down to the absolute bottom, and they don't like moving much, they're fairly lazy animals. So they will stand in a place and they will nibble until it's all gone. So if you want to create a little bear patch, sheep are great. Ponies, they will bite, but they won't nibble. So they graze in a slightly different way again. And the great thing with ponies is they move around a lot. They won't just stand still, they're constantly moving, constantly active. So here we have some Exmoor ponies, which we've had on the site this year. Um, it's a really hardy breed, um, and actually probably one of the closest breeds to uh, kind of the original wild horses who would have natively existed in this area. So they, this is what the land is expecting, and this is, this is how you should graze. And then, pigs. So we're not grazing with pigs at the moment, but this is something we're looking at in the future. The great thing is, so one thing that we want to achieve on the site, we want bare soil because all the insects, the solitary bees and things like that, they want bare soil to make their nests in. You can go in with diggers and do it that way. Or if you release a load of pigs, you'll have a lot of bare soil very quickly because they will go in and they'll turn over all the soil for you. So they can be a fantastic tool as well. Altogether, we have our kind of full arsenal also deer, a lot of sites use as well. We don't get many deer, and we're not really looking at that, but a lot of sites. We probably do get a few over from Friston Forest occasionally, but it's very rare for us to see them. We also get rabbit grazing, so we're not actively using the rabbits, but they are great at nibbling down on grass and getting it very short, similar to the sheep, just on a smaller scale, because they are smaller. So that's our grazing animals. So... Um, what we're actually doing on the site at the moment, so if you visited the site at the moment, you would see uh, these lovely steers here, really nice, friendly uh, cattle as well. So one of the reasons we choose them is because of their temperament. So you can go up, I wouldn't recommend it, we don't officially recommend it, but you can go up and you can stroke their noses. They're very friendly animals. Um, and therefore also when there's dogs around, when you have that one million visitors, people and the animals, if we get a more commercial breed, they can sometimes be a bit aggressive. These are fantastic. Even though they're males, they are fantastic. Uh, we've got the Exmoor ponies there. They've just left our site, unfortunately, but we still have some Shetland ponies on the site as well, so giving that diversity of grazing. Now, um, if you look at our cattle here, uh, you'll notice they've got a little collar on. Uh, just there. So these collars uh, are part of a no-fence system. So as I mentioned earlier on, we want this site to be open access and truly open access, but we need to control where the animals are going. We want to take down the fences. We want this site to look as untouched by people as we can. We want it to look, for want of a better word, wild, although it will never truly be wild. But we wanted to look that way. So we want to take down the fences. So we use these collar systems. So they go on around the cattle's neck. And then we can get our iPad or phone or computer. And we draw a line of where we want those cattle to stay. When the cattle get near to the edge, they get a little alarm bell. And as they get closer and closer, it rises in pitch. If they go right to the edge, they will get a small shock. It's about one-eighth of an electric fence. So it's much more humane than the electric fences. And then they will turn back and go back. After a few shocks, they soon realise what the sound means and they don't test it anymore. <laughs> one or two of them, truth be told, don't seem to mind it too much. So they occasionally do go over. 
So it's not the perfect system, so we always keep perimeter fences so that they can't get onto the road and things like that. But we can use this system, and we can use that on the GPS so we can say exactly where we want them. And if we have areas where we want to really graze, so we've got this stuff called tall grass on the side, really is overtaking a lot of the side. We want to graze that, but we don't want to graze this area over here. We can just draw the line, and that's where the cattle will graze. We just need to make sure they've got shelter and they've got water in that compartment. And it also means if we have a really busy footpath, we can keep them off that footpath because we've all been walking in the countryside and suddenly there's 10 cattle sat in the middle of the footpath. So we can stop them doing that. It's a really win-win. And also purely financially, if I, we had to replace all the internal fences, it would cost a lot more than buying those collars. So it's a win-win in every way. So what we do, we have our approximately 44 cattle. So we're mostly grazing with cattle at the moment because they do fantastic work of conservation grazing. There's previously been a lot of sheep on the site, so the site needs a bit of a rest from sheep. We will use them again in the future, but right now it's not the right animal. They nibble down the grass too much in places. So therefore we use our cattle. And behind our cattle here, you can see uh, this really long tufty grass. That is the tall grass. Left untouched, that will take over the entire site and we will get nothing but tall grass for a few years and then we'll get nothing but bramble. So we want to cre the, create that diversity. The cattle and the ponies are happy to eat tall grass. The sheep will not touch it. They will eat around it. So therefore, that's why we're using a mixture. We've got a few ponies left, but mostly using cattle. So during the summer, we put them down at the valley floor and we graze the wet grass and when it's a bit drier. Um, and then in the winter period, they go up onto the hillsides and they graze the chalk grassland. This also means our chalk grassland, which right now all the flowers are starting to come up. That means the cows aren't there eating all the flowers as well. So, chalk grassland, um, described as the rainforest in miniature, or Europe's rainforest. So within a single square metre, we can have up to 40 different species of plant living in that single square metre. And then, so we've got a bit of an image here. So there we have um, a bee orchid, which we get a lot of growing on the site. In another probably two months, we'll see all the bee orchids. So you can see it's not a perfect shot, but this part of the plant makes itself look and smell like a bee to attract other bees to it. And then here we can just see general just how many different types of flower are growing in our chalk grass and then the butterflies that that attracts. So, perfect example here. We want to take this stuff, this long, dense grass, which has all the flower seeds underneath it, but there's no way that it can get to the light. There's no way it can grow up through that grass. Our ponies come in, they graze this area hard, and then all those wildflowers can come up in the spring. So this area which we just grazed, we went there this afternoon with the team. Just before I came here, we had a walk around, and we have something called an early spider orchid. It does a very similar thing to the bee orchid, but it makes itself look like a spider. And they are everywhere this year. Last year we saw, I think when we looked at our four, we found five within a square metre this year. So they're doing fantastically well because of that grazing, because they can get to the light. The seeds are all in the ground and they will lay dormant for years and they can wait and wait. As soon as they get the light, they will come up. We then have what's called the semi-improved grass, and which has a very deceptive name. Uh, so the reason it is improved is essentially it's been made more productive. So back, uh, last time this was made more productive was in the 60s. So this area was ploughed back in the 50s and 60s. Um, so part of a lot of sites got ploughed at that time, part of the uh, post-war, ensuring that we were, weren't reliant on imports of food. So there was a lot of ploughing. Um, latterly, this area has been sheep, sheep grazed. Now, as I said, nothing wrong with sheep grazing. It has its place. But I think we could say it's probably, you can see there, there's just a green, and what we sometimes call in uh, conservation, a green desert. So what we've done in this area, very simple, nothing. 
We've done absolutely nothing. There's no animals in there. We completely rested, and we're not going to touch that for two years. It's already one year rested, and we're going to have a whole other year. I would recommend a walk up there at some point. You will see, especially in the next few months, every step you take, insects, butterflies will come flying up. You might want to watch out for adders as well, because they will be moving around. You will see just down here on the right, uh, the buzzards have started nesting on that site. Just across the road, um, we've had kestrels nesting. Um, shorted owls uh, are in this area hunting. That's because there's more voles, because there's more food source for them. And that's just giving it one year of resting. What we've learned from this site, which I didn't expect it to happen, it's just how quickly nature has recovered. So nature, just given one year, has thrived. We can still make this land productive, it can still be used and we will still farm it, but by letting it have a little bit of grass and a little bit of length and then maintaining that just allows nature to thrive alongside. It's not an either or, we can do both at the same time. So also in this picture you can see this kind of area around here where we've got a few trees and things like that. That's what we want to see happen in our semi-improved grass. And we want to see some trees, we want to see some scrub. Nature loves variety. We want some tall bits, we want some short bits, we want some bits where the sheep have nibbled it to the ground. We possibly want some bits where the pigs have come in and they've turned over and created some bare soil. That's what we want from this side. Chalk grass, and we manage very differently because it's a very specific habitat and we don't want uh, the brambles and the scrub to block out everything else. So we don't want as much diversity. We want the diversity is there, but in miniature. This we can think of different scales. And also, purely for legislation, we are under less obligations. Because it's not a rare habitat, semi-improved grassland, we can do more. We have that flexibility. We can try different things. We can experiment. Uh, we're even hoping that we might be able to recreate and revert it to something like chalk grassland, which would be fantastic. But we can play about with it. It's not a disaster if it goes wrong because it's such a common habitat. And then, at the bottom of the valley, we have our wet grassland. So, actually, this was taken quite a few years ago now, uh, this picture on the left. Uh, and we were looking at it in the office today, actually, and saying just how much of a monoculture, so just single species of grass, are growing along that bank. Now, many of you probably saw back in 2019 that it flooded quite significantly. It's actually now created quite a lot of biodiversity. There's a lot of concern at the time. Truth be told, it's probably less productive for farming. The animals probably won't get as much nutrition off of it, but there's different plants growing. We don't know if that's just the salt or just the way we're grazing it differently, but it's definitely changing. We then, as part of our wet grass, and we have these fantastic wet areas here as well. These are called, well, this over here is the lagoon, and this is called the salting. Uh, the salting because it was a medieval salt pan as well. And we've got these little islands, and these are fantastic. We've got oyster catchers nesting in this one here. Uh, we've got Canadian geese nesting on this one here. You regularly see the kingfisher and the shell ducks flying up and down here. So once again, it's another place. It's got that diversity. We see completely different species at different, different areas in the park. So that was the better for nature bit. So essentially grazing is our big thing. We are doing other things. We can go in and take cuts in certain places and then we can remove things. So there's certain areas where there's too much nutrition in the soil. Uh, so what we do there, we cut and then we take it away. And we're, we're kind of just physically removing all the nutrients in the soil. Nutrients will make things grow, but it means our rarer species, which are specially adapted for nutrient poor soils, they can't grow in those, and they'll just be dominated by nettles and things like that. Not necessarily bad things, nettles have a place, but not on our chalk grass. And so we're going to cut those, and we keep on cutting until all the nutrients is taken out. But anyway, better for people. Uh, our next big part of our challenge, uh, and perhaps a big bit at the moment, uh, which is moving along a pace, because nature takes a while, but people, we can do that stuff fairly quickly if be with a bit of investment. 
So I already talked a little bit about real open access. So using that fences, uh, no fence system so that we can graze the whole site and we can get people walking on the whole site. New paths, it's an easy one, it's an obvious one, but actually it's quite a laborious task digging in those new paths, going to Natural England saying, is it okay if we put a path here because we don't want to affect any of the nature negatively. We also have to, each time, we get the county archaeologist and they have to walk our new path of us as well. We just need to check we're not going to damage anything that we're going over. We found some stuff up there, so therefore we've had to raise our paths up above it. So actually, to put in a new path seems like a straightforward thing, but actually it's many months in the making to do something like that. So we've got a new, fantastic, about four and a quarter mile path going in, which should be going in in the next couple of months. Taking down fences, we talked about. Accessible trails. We, those of you who know the site, we have a fantastic concrete track that goes pretty much all the way to the beach, which is fantastic, and lots of people can use it, um, which is great, but we want people to enjoy more of that park. So we talk about that million visitors a year. I would guess 95% of them go along that concrete track to the beach and come back. Actually, my favourite places in the park aren't there. They're up in the hills. They're up at an area around what we call New Barn, where we have a beautiful dew pond. We have a barn where there's a barn owl living and he regularly flies in and out. That's the place which we want to get people to go and really experience and be inspired by nature. So how do we get people up there? We're buying some off-road mobility scooters, so hopefully they'll be with us by this summer, so people can off-road all the way up there. They've got a 30-mile <coughs> range, they can go off around the whole park, and we can make sure that the, we've got the paths in place. Uh, removing styles. So even people who are able to walk long distances, often styles uh, become tricky. So taking out as many styles as we can, and where we do need gates, then putting in gates, but where we don't need them, let's just remove them all together. Easy to follow routes. So, uh, many of you might be keen walkers, and uh, we see a lot of people, keen walkers, they come with their OS maps and their compass, and they know where they're going. However, we want this site to be for everyone. And actually, a lot of people, this is their first, or one of their first experiences of the countryside. I mentioned how many people come down from London, they don't have that confidence. They don't have the OS maps. So actually, just making sure those paths are super easy to follow. They have a map that they can hold, which you can give them, and you say, follow the pink arrows, something like that, and that gets them to there. They have an amazing experience. It's those first steps, and then they're engaged, and then they're hooked on the countryside and nature. Changing places toilet. So changing places are a specific type of toilet. So we've put in new toilets, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But the changing places toilet means even people with very severe disabilities can still access the site. They can get along the concrete track, so they can have those amazing experiences with nature. They can have a toilet that they can use. It has hoists in and things like that. So lots of people can use that. Accessibility guide. So this is about letting people know what the site is like. So somebody might feel that they can walk a little bit, they can do 100 metres and then they need to sit down. If we don't have any guide and any way of telling them, then they're not going to start off on that, that walk because they simply don't know. If we can tell people where are the benches, where are the toilets, how can you, um, maybe do we have stuff in braille, do we have um, audio things like that. If we can tell them that before they come, they can plan their visit and therefore they will choose to come because they can go with confidence and say, yes, I know what I can do. And also about just training our staff. So all our staff go through accessibility training so they can confidently help people that need that bit of support. And then we already mentioned the off-road mobility scooters, which I had a fantastic time about two weeks ago test driving all of them. And it got straight to the top of the hills. There wasn't anything we couldn't do on that thing. So it was great. And then I got to West Dean on an accessible uh, wheelchair as well. So yeah, great things, which will be on the site soon, we hope. So then we have our infrastructure project. So I mentioned earlier that we intended to spend about 1.9 million. It's now looking like 2.6 million because any buildings on listed buildings always ends up more expensive than you think. So. 
Uh, a lot of it is about tidying up the site. Uh, so a lot of our works are in this area. So this is Exit, our main visitor area. We also have foxholes, so lesser known. But if you go halfway down the valley and then take a left up the dry valley, there's a little kind of small farmstead there called foxholes where we have a lot of stuff going on too. So let's start off with Exit. We talked about the new toilets. Previously, there were six cubicles on the site. That's six for a million visitors a year. We've now gone up to 22, including two accessible toilets and the changing places toilet. So more people can... What we find is, it's not the thing that makes the day, but the bad toilets can ruin a day. So it's getting the basics right. New visitor centre. So visitor centre, those of you who had been to the old one, it was on two levels, so if you came in on a wheelchair, you couldn't get, well, there was a chair lift, but that filled up half of the area. So we've completely put it onto one floor, uh, and we put in new interpretation, or accessible interpretation. And the big change, the big change in there, is it is open 364 days a year. Previously, it was run by volunteers, who did a fantastic job, and we will be welcoming back volunteers soon. But to be reliable and to be a year-round destination, uh, and thinking about kind of the local tourism impact as well of being a true year-round destination, we need to have that staffed every day except Christmas, which is what we're doing. Uh, we then have our new grab-and-go, which I'll talk to you about in a moment, and our new offices, uh, which we've just moved into this week, and yeah, they're very, really nice. So, toilets. Our changing places toilet, uh, nice long corridors, all kind of individual cubicles, all, all kind of easy clean. The thing that most people have come to talk to me about since we've done all this work, this £2.6 million project, is the toilets. That's the thing people come and find me and tell me about. So it does make a big difference to people's visit. <laughs> so we're really pleased with those. Uh, you'll excuse all the boxes, I took this today. This is our new grab and go. So, most sites uh, generally think about one catering outlet or one food and beverage outlet per 60,000 people. Previously, we had one cafe run by a tenant for a million people. So, we put in the tenant in the cafe, they do sit down, they do a fantastic catered off offer. This is about grab and go, this is the people who want to go in quickly, move on. We'll talk more about the kind of stuff we're stocking this with, which is a big part of our story too. Uh, we then have a big change, simple but bins. It's like the toilets, people notice it if it's wrong. There were no bins on sites. So we now actually collect waste, which has meant that the site is much cleaner, it's much tidier. Signage and directional signage, we've replaced it all. It was all worn out, it's all now in there so you can find where you're going on site. Water fountains, if you're on a long hike, it's on the South Downs Way. If you're doing an all day hike, you can fill up your water. Simple things like this. Ice cream trailer. I mean, that's just everyone loves an ice cream. And then just generally improving the site, tidying it up, putting in some flowers here and there, things like that, making it look smart. So this is our new visitor centre. Um, so we've got a bit about the, uh, the dark skies, because we're in the dark skies reserve, so we've got to stuff about that. And you've got a virtual reality headset, so you can see everything and see the Milky Way. Uh, we have all our stock, which I'm going to talk to you more about in a moment. Um, and as I mentioned, this will be staffed 364 days a year with volunteers in there to help and improve that experience. Now, when we're in the visitor centre, we were thinking to ourselves, how do we engage people with nature? Uh, so there's so many species there. So we decided seven species for seven sisters. And these are the ones that we focus our conversations about. Partly because they're nice, attractive species, but also because if these species are doing well, it generally means the site's going quite well and our management of it's going quite well. If these start going missing, that means something's wrong. So we have, as I mentioned, our beautiful bee orchids. Um, so they will come up in the chalk grasslands um, and yeah, um, absolutely beautiful to see. So if you're ever down there, just by the beach on the edge of the cliff, the, the, the cliffs there, there's some there in the summer. 
the yellow horned poppy. We talked about the vegetated shingle earlier. Incredibly rare habitat. So a really hardy plant, uh, but really beautiful when it blooms. So the whole vegetated shingle in the summer just covered with colour, and a lot of it comes from these poppies. And then we have our Adonis blue butterflies. So only really live on really good quality chalk grasses. So incredibly rare butterfly. Um, not to be mistaken for the chalk blue, they are slightly different colours. I can't tell the difference, to be honest, but there are those that can. Um, I'm told it's to do with the edge of the wing there, and that's what you've got to look for. And the Adonis blue is a bit more vibrant, is what I'm told. I think if they were next to each other, you could tell. But beautiful butterflies. We talked about our ring plovers and the, and the plight of them nesting on the shingle and laying an egg that looks like a pebble and is so easily trodden on. Uh, we have our red shanks, love the salt marsh, so really succeeding in the salt marsh and want that wet. And also we're starting to experiment. We have some control through our sluice gates of the water levels. So if we can control that so there's lots of mud. They like the mud because that's where the invertebrates live, which they can eat. So in the autumn, making sure we've got lots of mud for them so they can feed up. We changed our levels last year and we had our best year for 20 years for wading birds because usually they stop for a day and go on, but they stayed there for two, three weeks to fatten up because there was enough food for them to stay. Uh, then this one, this is our skylark. Um, if you're on the side of the moment, you'll probably see these. They do a fantastic thing. They fly right up into the air and they flutter there for ages and then they just drop vertically down and they make a lot of noise. Another bird that struggles though, once again, they are a ground nesting bird. So their eggs are on the floor once again. And as people and dogs come through, completely no intent, but can easily tread, can easily disturb them. So it's about trying to educate people on where are the best places to go with your dogs, where are the places not to go, things like that. And then our widgeon. Uh, so on the water there, we see our widgeons. They make fantastic sounds, they're really distinct, the sound of them, so people can listen out for those as well. So animals, uh, creatures, um, butterflies, flowers that are, apart from the Adonis blue, relatively easy to recognise. Um, so therefore people can start to, and hopefully, most visits you will see one of them. So people can start to identify, they can start to feel, and start to understand what makes this site so special. So we've got lots in our visitor centre about that. And then we talked a little bit about suppliers um, and kind of local economy. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have that duty around the local economy. Um, so what we need to do, we take a number of things into consideration when we're choosing our new suppliers. We think about cost. If we buy the most expensive supplier, yes, they might be local, they might be carbon neutral, they might be plastic free. But if half of our visitors can't afford to purchase it, then that's no good for us. Especially if we want this site to really be more inclusive. If all our shops and cafes are incredibly expensive, straight away, huge demographics don't feel welcome there. So ensuring that we have affordable costs. We're in a lucky position. We don't have to make money on this site. We just have to break even. That's my only challenge from my boss. Don't lose money, break even. So we're lucky we can help that a little bit with the cost. Carbon footprint. At the same time, these are just things that we consider. We don't go completely by because we are very aware that a lot of very small businesses, they can't tell us what their carbon footprint is. We don't want to exclude small businesses just because they haven't done their carbon accounting. But are they trying to make the right steps in the right direction? Are they looking at how they can reduce their carbon footprint? That's enough for us to say, yes, you're the kind of people we want to work for. Local sourcing. So we could have the most fantastic company ever, but they're based in China. Do we want to be shipping it a car way across the world? I spent ages looking for a plastic-free ice cream. There's only one from Yorkshire. So do I go for the ice cream just up the road, or do I go for the one from Yorkshire? So we have to balance it, but can, trying to think about local sourcing wherever possible, Obviously, our focus is the National Park, but uh, we just got all our furniture made by a guy from Hastings. They don't have to be in the National Park, they just need to be local. 
social responsibility. So Jude's Ice Cream, uh, we work with, we work with Holy Cow as well, but Jude's Ice Cream, uh, they're carbon negative, they're national park based, um, they are locally sourced, um, and also they give vast amounts of their profits to charities. So they take their social responsibility really seriously. So when we're looking for our suppliers, that's a fantastic example. And we also, going back a step, I forgot to mention, for our local sourcing, we are so lucky we have one and a half miles from our doorstep, we have liquid spirit coffee roasters. So even our coffee, just a mile and a half. And the great thing is, whenever we run out because we forgot to order, she's there in five minutes with spare. <laughs> so we have a fantastic relationship, which actually helps us operate much better too. Environmental impact. So including plastic free in that. We don't say we're completely plastic free because we would rather go for the local sustainable supplier just up the road who uses a bit of plastic than the company in China who's shipping it over and not taking their social responsibility very seriously, but has gone plastic free. So everything's a balance, but where possible, where the options there, we go plastic free. And then finally, whenever we're using animal products, uh, whether that be meat or whether that be anything else, we consider the animal welfare. Are they signing up to high welfare standards? Our then our officers look at all of that and then they try to decide which suppliers are going to be the best for us based on all of that stuff. It's a balancing act and it's often quite complex. These are two suppliers who are easy decisions. Uh, liquid spirit, plastic free, locally sourced, can trace their beans to, the, to exactly where they're coming from. So, yeah, but some much more difficult. Crisps. Oh, trying to find plastic free crisps, almost impossible. <laughs> Okay, so moving down the road, we mentioned uh, foxholes, so I'm going to rush on now because uh, we want to do some questions possibly at the end. So foxholes cottages is about more nights under the stars. So one of the things we want to do as a national park is we want more children spending the nights in the dark skies reserve under the stars. So we are putting in, we've got a fantastic camping barn and then out the front we have a campsite so we're putting new facilities block in there. That's been delayed because one of the walls had no foundations, it turned out. But that will, that will be done at some point in the future. Um, and also having, making it affordable. So we talked about those demographics who can't afford high-end high accommodation. We can do camping for £10 a night. So really making sure that more people can enjoy that site. We then have the cottages as well. Once again, not going high-end. So we have our three levels. We have campsite, we have camping barn, and then we have cottages. So you get a bit more privacy, a bit more comfort, but still affordable. So I want to have holiday cottages that a family can spend a night there for less than £100. And then, what we really want is this to be a year-round site. So my challenge to my team at the moment is if somebody walks in on a wet Wednesday in February to that visitor centre, says, what's there to do today? They should have an answer. They should be able to say, this is what you should do. This is the wildlife you should go and see. We have a trail to go and do. Go and follow this trail. We have a writer in residence at the moment who's doing poetry courses and things like that. So there's one going on this weekend. Uh, Buzz Active it used to be Spray Water Sports. They have a centre on the side. So they're taking people out on the water. We're about to recruit a load of engagement volunteers. Their purpose is to just talk to the public and just to engage, talk about the wildlife, and also take people on walks. We're going to have walking volunteers too, so take people out on the walks. So every single day, ideally, I want a walk going out. So you can say, come back at two, and you can go and learn about the wildlife. You can learn about the history. Transport. So one of our big challenges on site. If you were there on uh, Easter bank holiday weekend, by 11 o'clock, those car parks are full. It's one in, one out. So getting more people on the bus. For our business plan, doesn't look great because that's our biggest income, is the car park. However, we want people to come and go on the bus. We have a bus route that goes every 10 minutes during the day. So it's fantastic. And actually, we discovered, uh, talking to Brighton and Hove buses, from Brighton Station, the most requested stop on the entire Brighton and Hove buses network is Seven Sisters Country Park. So people are starting to use it. I suspect it's similar from Eastbourne Town Centre, though we don't know for sure for that one. 
Um, so, uh, and also cycling routes. We're starting to think how, if you're on site around Friston and down the park, great cycling. But I get a little frustrated. I can understand why, but I get frustrated because people have to drive there to get their car out of the park, at the back of their car to go for a cycle. So let's, could we create a cycle route to link Eastbourne to us and over to Seaford and link the whole area off-road? Because at the moment you have to cycle along the A259, which isn't, which isn't fun. <laughs> and then finally, electric vehicle charging is something we're all looking at. Unfortunately, we looked at it and realised that if we plugged a car into our electric system, it would all explode. <laughs> so, we found out we have to buy an entire new substation, or do we install solar panels? So, it's a big piece of work that we're going to take years to do, but really trying to get that done, so then we can change all our vehicles to electric as well. And then finally, we talked already a bit about volunteering, but getting more people volunteering, doing different roles, social media volunteers, events, the walk volunteers, or just micro-volunteering, getting people who are just visiting the site that day, going to have two-minute beach cleans, uh, something called a bash and burn, so we've got big areas of gorse, we need to cut it back and we need to burn it. So getting people to help with that, they can just help on the day, they don't have to commit to every single week coming back. It's fantastic when people can do that, but we appreciate not everyone can. Oh, I forgot about heritage. <laughs> Okay, so very quickly, so we went, talked about this map at the beginning. Every orange mark on there is heritage. So how can we start to tell that story? Um, so we're looking at augmented reality. So on your phone, you'll be able to stand there and look around and see. At the top of the hill, there was a medieval village. So you'll be able to see what that medieval village and that medieval church actually looked like. So we've got uh, a Bronze Age burial mound and a Neolithic burial mound up there. Along here, we've got the remains of uh, some of the first test uh, World War I trenches. So when they were practicing the first ones, they built them there and fired uh, artillery from that side of the valley to see how well they worked. So those are still visible on the ground. They've been filled in, they're not big holes, but you can still see them on the ground. And then we have our tank traps, we have our pill boxes. So all this stuff, so could we do archaeology days, uh, getting more people involved who are excited about this stuff. It's another reason for people to visit. It's there, there all year round, so we can really make it a year round attraction. And there we are. Right. <laughs>